of my colleagues from school board, um, from La Cunada, San Marino, and Pasadena school board joining me this afternoon. So when I call on you, would you please introduce yourself? Josh, in no particular order, so <laughs> Josh. I am uh, Josh Epstein. I am a governing board member of La Cunada and Unified, uh, newly elected this year, so mm -hmm. I'm still learning the ropes. Um, I've got three children in the La Cunada school district, a fourth grader, an eighth grader, and a high school junior. Car Carolyn? I'm Caroline Anderson, like Josh. I am on the La Cunada Unified uh, Governing Board and just newly elected. I have two boys, a seventh grader and a sixth grader, and actually a host of nieces and nephews also in La Cunada Unified. Jane? Hi, my name is Jane Chan, also a newly elected board member, um, but this time out in San Marino Unified. And I have four children, uh, two sons who just graduated from San Marino who are freshmen in college uh, at uh, Rochester Institute of Tech in upstate New York and American University doing Zoom University right now. And then I've also got an eighth grader at the middle school here and a here in, uh, also in San Marino. Jennifer, Holly. Hello, my name is Jennifer Hall Lee. I am newly elected Pasadena Unified School District and I live in Altadena. Thank you for having me. And the representative from my district, Scott. I'm Scott Phelps, um, not newly elected, I'm an old timer. Uh, I have uh, a 10th grader at Blair and uh, a graduate of Marshall. Pleased to be here, thank you for having us. Tina Fredericks. Hi, thank you for this opportunity, Tina Fredericks, newly elected. I have two daughters, 10 and 13. Uh, one's at Willard and one went to Blair and McKinley and is currently at Cal State LA early entrance program. Thank you for having me. Corey. Hi, I'm Corey Barbary. I'm from the, I'm a governing board member in San Marino. Um, I have a fifth grader um, at Carver um, School in, in the elementary school in San Marino. Nice to be here. Julie. Hi, sorry. <laughs> I am getting home right now. Okay. Um, my name is Julie Chanlin. I am newly elected to the San Marino Unified Board. I have a fifth grade daughter in the same class as Corey Barbary's daughter. Mm -hmm. And I also have a eighth grade daughter and 10th grade daughter. Both of them are at Flint Ridge Prep in La Cunada. Great, great. Thank you. Thanks for having the board. me. To, for the board members for joining us today. So the purpose of this conversation is to promote understanding and dialogue around AB 10, opening, reopening of schools in California, and to provide a format for parents and local school education leaders to get some clarity on the path forward for reopenings. So I understand that many parents may have questions directly about the school openings of their schools. So I would respectfully ask you to reserve those questions for your local school members during the school board meetings. So I'm shifting those questions to the, to the school board members at the school board meetings. Um, and, you know, as we have read, the city of San Francisco sued San Francisco Unified School District to reopen. And here in LA County, elementary schools are with waivers allowed to open as early as next week. There is a spectrum of local opening guidelines. So we would like to hear today is how the legislation AB 10 would mandate reopenings of schools in California. So let's get started. It is my pleasure to give a quick introduction to my friend assembly member Phil Ting. First and foremost, assembly member Ting is a father of two wonderful children in the San Francisco public school system. He was elected in 2012 and currently serves as the chair of the budget committee. The committee oversees the crafting of California's $156 billion budget. And recently the assembly member authored AB 10 legislation calling for the state to prioritize the safe opening of public schools campuses. So without um, further ado, Assembly Member Team, thank you very much for joining us today. 
Thank you, Sandra. It's great to be here. And I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person. But uh, you know, when, Sa when Sandra calls and asks me to do something, it's hard to, hard to say no. In fact, I was on the assembly floor yesterday and Chris Holden turned to me and said, are you talking to a whole bunch of Pasadena parents <laughs> tomorrow? And I said, I am, I am. I go, word, word travels. So um, you know, you're very well represented uh, in, in the legislature with my good friend, Chris Holden. Uh, I will I, I will add something to my bio, which I really don't tell my constituents in San Francisco, which is I was born and raised in LA County uh, and went to public schools in LA County. So I have, um, um, you know, have a lot of uh, memories and fond uh, fond thoughts of LA as well. So what, I, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit less about AB 10 and perhaps just talk about um, what the legislature is sort of advocating for. Um, and you know, the governor has been talking about um, you know, us having discussions around a school reopening plan. Uh, we are absolutely in the middle of those discussions. And so I, I can sort of talk, uh, you know, I can give some broad ideas of kind of where we are without going too far into specifics. Um, but just to give you a sense of think our, our, our thinking, um, my, my kids have been on Zoom for the last year. The San Francisco was dis distance learning when we first shut down in mid-March and it's been distance learning this whole time. It's been very frustrating because San Francisco actually went into yellow. And even when we went into yellow in the fall, we did not open up. So as a parent, it was uh, you know very frustrating to feel like at San Francisco, we, at San Franciscans, we had really done our job, stayed home, sheltered in place, our, our COVID numbers were some of the lowest in the entire state, and yet um, our schools still don't open up. And I think I, I just had a vaccine virtual town hall yesterday, and uh, one of the UCSF uh, doctors, the professors, just said, just to give you a, a, a sense of the difference, you know, from the, I think it was the 1918 Spanish flu in San Francisco with a population of 300,000 people or 350,000 people, 3,500 people died because of Spanish flu. And uh, due to COVID, we've only had 352 deaths. Uh, and our population is almost a million people now. And obviously significantly more dense. So um, it just shows you, I think, how seriously we've taken it in our, in our city slash county and uh, really how, how hard we've been working to keep keep COVID managed. So let me sort of just talk to you about some of the broader pieces of what we're, we're thinking and just give you a sense of what the legislature um, is advocating for. Uh, the governor proposed a, a $2 billion reopening uh, plan, which we are all also in favor of. I think the only difference for us is that we really uh, feel that we should be um, Doing everything possible to encourage um, all, all of you, all the school districts to open up. Sorry, I'm, I'm gonna sneeze in one second. I'm, I'm gonna sneeze at Steph when I start talking again. So, um, so, so ra rather than have a, a plan that is sort of an opt-in uh, plan, uh, we'd rather have a plan where Everybody gets money, uh, but then really, um, you you don't get to keep the money if you don't open by particular days. Uh, we really think that even in purple, we could have um, small cohorts go back. Uh, we definitely feel that um, you know once you're in red, you can you can go back within a certain amount of time. We absolutely want um, every school district to be bargaining their health and safety plans with uh, other unions um, and to be you know, working in cooperation. I think there's been a lot of negativity towards um, teachers unions. And I think my, my, my standard line is look, I mean, you know, when you go ask people to work in a pandemic that we've told everybody is deadly, I mean, you'd want people who are going to work have an opinion about what are, what are their work conditions? I think that's totally fine. I, you know, I think that is, that's totally uh, appropriate. Now, having said that, I know because of the, the lack of specificity regarding public health guidelines and, uh, you know, the fact that you all don't have public health officers in your employment, um, it's been very challenging to figure out what the parameters of those discussions are. So I think we're trying to, you know, put some 
put some deadlines. And fr frankly, you know, the biggest help is President Biden. It's, it's President Biden has said he wants schools open in his first hundred days. And so you're seeing this, not just here in California, this national movement to do everything possible across the country to really get schools open and especially you know k through six schools that's really what we've been focused is k through six not not because we don't want middle schools or high schools focused uh, open but we just feel like with younger kids there's so much uh, more at risk and it's just frankly so much harder to learn on zoom uh, the other piece which i saw in the chat box come up is uh, we definitely believe that all school employees who are going back should be uh, prioritized that there should be at least an offer of a vaccination given to those um uh, given to those, uh, um, that opportunity given to employees. And so I think that is something that's uh, very, very, very important. In terms of learning loss, there's also a $4 billion learning loss proposal. And, and we're just very um, adamant that we think the learning loss money should go to everybody. Everyone's had learning loss, uh, that it should go out, um, you know, based on kind of the formulas that we already have, but that the learning loss recovery should be, um, almost all of it should really be spent on in-person learning. So um, we don't want more learning loss money going to distance learning or some sort of, um, you know, some, some sort of computer software program. We really want to, you know, have the opportunity to bring, uh, you know, bring kids back in and, and give the districts a certain amount of time. So not just a few months, but a cer certain amount of time, you know, a year, a year or 18 months or two years to really um, spend that money on learning loss. We, we, I actually feel depending on, with the district's plans, you could do some learning loss mitigation this this year, this summer, and you could do learning loss mitigation next summer as well as during the school year. We think it's going to be a real um, potentially, you know, 18 to 24 month effort to really do uh, learning loss mitigation. So um, to me, those are the um, biggest, you know, the, just, the, just the biggest kind of thoughts of where um, where we're at. I, I know as districts, it is very hard because um, you're, you know, everything's dependent on the county health, public health officers, state public health officers. I know the guidance um, hasn't always been as clear as you'd like, or frankly, probably gives you, I, I kind of joke, it's like a buffet. And, you know, when you're at a buffet, you don't know what to eat, and you kind of end up spending all your time arguing over what to go grab from the buffet rather than, um, you know, having something that's just a prefix menu where, you know, I'm not, I'm just having dinner and that's it. That's all I need to know is I'm having dinner and just get a yes or no on dinner. So, um, you know, we're very much cognizant of that. And so we are trying to uh, find an approach that really is going to work, um, frankly, all across the state. I think that's the biggest challenge with ed code is, as you all know, it's got to work for Pasadena, but it's also got to work for, uh, you know, Redlands and San Bernardino and Imperial and, you know, it's got to work for Stockton, it's got to work for San Francisco, it's got to work for Chico, um, Redding, uh, you know, every, every district, regardless of whether they're small, rural, urban, suburban, um, it goes on forever, you know, but, but you know, we're very, very cognizant. Uh, I am hopeful that we are going to be able to have uh, a proposal that we could hopefully announce in the next 24, 48 hours. I'm not. I'm, I'm being optimistic here, um, and and just hoping that we can, you know, all kind of give you all. And I think what we're going to propose is not a, a ceiling, but it's more of a floor. So obviously, if you want to do more, you could do more. We're just saying you have to at least do this to to be able to spend the money that is going to is going to uh, um, kind of qualify you for the appropriation. So let me just kind of stop there. Happy to take questions and I'm sorry um, I can't answer all, all with all the detail that I normally would like to, but I'm gonna try my best. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much. What, what's, what's, uh, Sandra's meeting, I don't know if you, you want me to call people or you wanna call people, Sandra? Or? Listen, I defer to you, assembly members. So sure, I, go for okay. it. Yeah, if, okay. if, if you raise your hand, I think I could see it. Uh, okay. in the, uh, no. this is Tina I, see, I see Jenny raising her hand as well. If I, if, if I keep missing you because it's like three pa five pages of people, <laughs> just kind of shout out or put in the chat box or something. So go go ahead, Tina. Oh, sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Sorry. No, no go. Just jump, um, go ahead. Just go, and then we'll go. Um, I don't know if you have any input on or 
in, in the next round or legislation, uh, any input on the prioritization of vaccines for teachers who go in person first, you know, yeah, so we, basically K to two. Yeah, we, we, we believe that not just teachers, but all school employees who are going back to work need to be prioritized. And when we say prioritize, I think we would even go one step further as they need to be offered the opportunity to, um, uh, to, to vaccinate. So we're not saying you have to get vaccinated, but they have to be made the offer. Now, you know, our feeling is if you're offered vaccination and you choose not to vaccinate, then you have to go back to work or you have to, you know, take leave or something, but you can't, you know, once you've decided to make that choice to not vaccinate, uh, once that offer has been made, then that's, that's a whole different situation. Um, and what's great is this is what's wonderful about having, um, you know, national leadership is we're hearing news that, you know, there's like, hey, today we have this many more vaccines and you and you hear President Biden talk about, no, now we're going to have this many more vaccines. And so even just in, if even if we just reserve the additional vaccine. So let's just say, hey, all the vaccines we thought were coming in the next two months is already spoken for. Well, just give the additional vaccines to ed educators and we'd be done. So just to give you a sense of the numbers. Statewide, there's only, not only, but there's 600,000 school employees, only 300,000 teachers, right? I mean, you've heard, I'm sure you saw in the LA Times, uh, you know, Superintendent Butner say, hey, you give us 25,000 vaccine, LA USD would open. We're going to open it up, right? So that, that, that to me seems like, boy, that's not a big price to pay. And they're always saying, oh, well, that means other people have to wait, people have to wait. It's like, no, it's not. It's not. It's, it's like, it's actually the wrong way of thinking. It is the fact that we're actually starting to see or hear we're trying to get more vaccination. So it's about really reserving some of that additional and making sure that that goes to prioritizing school reopenings. So that, that's, where, that's where we're kind of standing. Uh, Jenny. Hi, thanks. I'm an LAUSD parent, and I just wanted to say we actually have quite a few LA parents joining us today, too. And I appreciate Sandra for inviting us sure. um, to tag along with the Pasadena uh, parents. Um, but we have quite a few from LA. I just wanted to um, ask, you know, I appreciate your bill, which would create a mandate. I'm sure you know what's going on in Los Angeles, even though yes. we've been cleared to reopen, we don't have a labor agreement. And I, a lot of parents believe that without some kind of mandate, it's really not going to happen this school year. And parents are getting really frustrated. They haven't even reopened to serve kids with disabilities. They had a voluntary deal for and about 800 out of 67,000 kids with disabilities got after school tutoring and some services. So I'm just wondering if you believe that the state deal, I know you're in the middle of negotiations and we can't wait to hear what you come up with, but will it include some kind of mandate in the red tier, which is what I'm reading about in Politico? Right, right, right. So I, I don't know that it will include a mandate, but what I would say is um, it would include some really good, we, we want to make it such a big carrot that you can't say no to the carrot. Um, and so and I think what we're trying to thread is you have, um, you have school employees who are legitimately scared, right? We, we've, we've been telling everybody for a year, this is a scary disease. This disease kills you. So you could respect why people aren't saying, hey, send me back to work or you know, let's, let's, let, let me just take all the advice you've been telling me to do, disregard it and go do something else, right? That, their response to me is very rational. Uh, I had to go back to work in May of last year and I can tell you, I was concerned, right? I, I, we've been going back to the Capitol. We go back regularly. It's a lot fewer of us in the Capitol, but I'm telling you, we are in the Capitol and it doesn't give me, um, it's, it's better now because we have so few people in there. But when I first went back into the building going to work, it was not, it was concerning, right? And, and at least now there's more testing. Um, we have better idea of how this disease is transmitted. So you have a little bit uh, better feel about things you can do, things you can't do. Um, so I, I think we're not, I, I don't think we're gonna have a mandate. And part of it is, um, you know, we got a significant amount of feedback from everybody in labor saying, don't, don't, don't make it a mandate because we didn't want to have a situation. We don't want a situation where we had a mandate and we were basically um, pushing the possibility of a sick out or a strike on the first day. So we've been trying to thread a needle just like the president's trying to thread a needle. And um, 
look, look, we're all we're all trying to be respectful adults, and we're all trying to get everyone in a in a good place. But we're we're all trying to get to the same place. It's just there's a lot of emotions, and um, you know, one of the main, the main reasons I've never ran for school board is you know there's so many emotions when you talk about schools. There's no shortage, right? There's school short. There's emotions about teachers and about curriculum and about schools, and you know, it's and I I, and I really feel that I don't really do that much legislating in the education arena. I, I may never again, but I'll tell you, it's um. There's a lot of feeling around it, and we're trying to, you know, again acknowledge people's very legitimate fears because they are legitimate, um, and, and really trying to figure out, okay, what can we do to get you back to the classroom. And frankly, everybody wants to go back to the classroom. Nobody's saying they don't want, like there's no discussion about whether people want to go back. They want to go back. It's just a matter of, you know, doing it in a way that they feel is safe and not going to threaten their loved ones, their family. Yeah, Jenny. Phil, um, I'm going to have you, um, I'm going to have Josh um, be asking a question next. Go. I just wondered um, in the governor's original proposal, um, the testing requirements were quite onerous, especially for, you know, we, we're La Cunada is a very small district. I, I can only speak to that, but but those were, the, the, were going to be in, incredibly challenging uh, requirements for us to meet. And I, I wondered if you could speak to a little bit about about uh, about testing requirements. Yeah. So, so we, we continue to have, um, we, we, could, we also advocate for a certain amount of testing cadence. Um, I think the, the difference is, is after you have vaccination, while you still probably need to do some certain amount of testing, you could do a significant less, you could do you know, significant slower cadence, frankly. Um, and so that, that detail hasn't all been worked out. We definitely do continue to advocate for a certain amount of testing, uh, but really I think where the discussion has really moved has really been, the more focused move has been really around vaccination. Thank you. Um, Phil Campbell? You're you on mute. mute. Um, you're Not unmuted. Okay, there you go, Phil. Yeah, we're not going to do the uh, miming thing. Um, I, I lost. Uh, I just lost track of what the mandate was for through all the mandating. Was it for getting vaccines? No. Uh, what we're what we're asking is that uh, we're not mandating everything. We're just asking that uh, before school employees go back to work, that they get offered vaccination. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's different tiers of risk and, you know, for a relatively healthy 24 year old teacher, that's a, a different risk zone than say I am, I, a healthy 60 year old, which is a different risk zone from a 70 year old with, you know, coronary heart disease. So uh, I, I don't want to take a vaccine away from somebody who needs it more than me. Understood. We, we didn't want to end up, you know, splitting hairs because then we thought it'd be easy, it'd be harder to even implement. So we thought, uh, once I, I heard the number, again, we're talking 600,000 educators in total, which, you know, given the impact of what we're talking about, I think it's, um, you know, I think it's yeah. totally appropriate. They, they're right. already in a certain tier. It's just making sure that they get the opportunity to get vaccinated. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, and, and that doesn't include staff either. Or, you know. Anyways, thanks. Uh, that's, I was just unclear on that. Phil, I do want to um, have this question from, you know, my colleague in the Outdoor Learning Initiative. You know, that's something that we've been working on. And her question, Karen, is that is anyone um, you're talking to discussing using outdoor spaces for learning to accelerate returning students to school safely? Yeah, we don't, we don't have an a opinion on that. It's really up to the district locally. If they want to go look at those options, they're, they're totally welcome to, we, we try to stay pretty focused in certain particular areas. Sarah. 
Hi, assembly member. Thanks so much. Um, I worked in the assembly in 2000 in the budget committee. So it's uh, always fun to watch the machinations going on there. Um, also served as a chief of staff to an LAUSD school board member and I'm a parent of three public school kiddos. Um, so I'm trying to understand, um, it sounds like vaccination that the governor and legislature may be coming to an agreement around offering vaccinations for teachers before they go back to work. Well, I'm just saying that's that's where, that's the position we're advocating for. I don't want to characterize it. We have not reached agreement on that issue. Okay. I'm just saying uh, that's what we're advocating for. We think yeah. that's. Yeah. And if that is the case, that's slightly different from what the CDC and President Biden and Vice President yeah. Harris are saying, which yeah. is understandable. We are a different beast over here. Um, but I guess my question would be, as part of those negotiations, is the position also to try to push educators, um, all school site staff, to the front of the lines then, recognizing the harms that are being done to kids? Yeah, no, I, th I think, I, I, no, I think there's no, there's no question. Um, one, they're, they're already, teachers are already in the, what is it, 1B category. Um, and so they're already um, in many counties starting to become eligible uh, to be given vaccination. So it's not even they have to be prioritized. They're already starting to, to do it. I think part of it is just ensuring we get enough supply. And, and frankly, it's trying to figure out how to get them in line per se. And, and so we, you know, we're, we're like, and this is where I think it's it's nice to hear districts. I just got an email from Berkeley Unified District, and they're basically doing it on their school sites. And I think, you know, um, th this is where I hear about LA Unified. But you know, Superintendent Butner is like saying, "Hey, we got people ready at our sites to do vaccination." So, I mean, I think it's going to look a little bit different in all the communities. And this is where um, it's the counties need to work with the districts to figure out how how best to do it. But I think we're trying to figure out how to do it the fastest once we can get our hands on, on the supply. But we, we believe that within the next, you know, I, and I think to, to the target date would really be kind of, um, you know, mid April or so, cause that's when, you know, President Biden has been talking about it. So, so people have been starting to think around mid April. Um, and it's also just because right now we're, we're already in the beginning of February. So just given how long things take and, discussions and all that, uh, meaning mid-April at, at, at the soonest for really much more uh, broader opening up, is that um, by then you really have enough runway to get people you know, vaccinated, to, to get people the time to get um, their classrooms ready, all that sort of stuff. So, so um, given that time frame, we should really, if we're focused, be able to do what we need to do to get things open up. Great. Thanks. Susan? Thank you for calling on me. Uh, Susan Nisman with uh, Speak Up Parents in Los Angeles. Thank you very much, uh, Assemblymember Ting, for giving us this opportunity. And thank you, Sandra. Um, I have two questions, actually. One, I wanted, I've been following the hearings. Those drag on. <laughs> anyway, I got to meet you there, watching you in those long we're, we're say we're thorough. <laughs> Pardon me? We try to say we're thorough. So. Yes, you were very we, thorough, and I appreciated that. I learned a lot. Um, I'm wondering, will there be a um, aspect of the trailer bill and a resolution that you're hoping in the next 48 hours that also addresses the mental health component, the socio-emotional uh, uh, um, learning and well-being, yeah. which has also taken quite a hit? Um, if we're going to be reopening, it's not just the, um, the learning loss that needs to be addressed, but it goes hand in glove with okay. a um, healthy mental health uh, child. So the so the learning loss, the four billion dollars of learning loss money, um, mental uh, you know behavioral health, mental health is is an allowable use for some of that for that money, um, and I forget whether it is also a real allowable use for the reopening funds, the two billion, but definitely for the learning loss money, we we made that an allowable use. Now we don't. Um, we don't do a set aside. We don't specify how much we're telling all of you to spend on behavioral health. But I, I would just hope that for all the you know school board members that that you put that in your thinking as as you get money, because I know that 
there'll be so much pressure to spend money here and there. And sometimes that kind of gets lost in the shuffle, but I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, just, just seeing my kids and just their, their loss of interest in learning and, right. uh, and they're, and they're generally really inquisitive kids. They're just, haven't seen their friends. I, it's like hard to get them out of the house. And I know for everybody who's got kids, what I'm saying is not unique to my kids. This has just happened across uh, the board. I agree. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope it will be, a, I like that, that it's, it'll be allowed and I hope that that'll be um, basically specifically called out. Um, in terms of the, my, my other quick question is, um, you mentioned how, yeah, the teachers have every right, all of us, you know, to be frightened. Um, we've been told this is a deathly thing that's happening. And um, we also find that our parents are frightened, many of them. So will there be support for in this reopening for allowing still for choice where parents who aren't quite ready to send their kids back to school can yes. continue distance learning? We, yeah, and I think what we anticipate is we don't specify what opening means, right? It's just a certain amount of in-person. So we know that for a lot of schools that are open, they're doing hybrids, they're doing staggered classrooms. It's really up to all the all the districts, the school board members, the superintendents to really figure that out. But I would imagine that what you're gonna see is really kind of more of a hybrid. Yes, absolutely. Any student who wants to remain at home because uh, perhaps they're immunocompromised or they have certain, you know, a, there's certain vulnerabilities. Absolutely, they they are um, allowed to have that opportunity. Well, and, and just like and again, just like teachers, if you have um, some immunocompromised, you know, you're immunocompromised as well. Uh, I know what I said is, you know, if you're offered vaccine, you don't take it. You got to go back. But uh, I, I forgot to say that. No, if you have you know, specific situations, uh, medical issues, of course, those are all, um, you know, we we take in that into account in our in our legislation and absolutely allowing both teachers and students that, that ability. Thank you. Melva, you've been waiting so patiently from Sierra Madre. Hi there, um, this is Melva Alvarez. I'm, my daughter's an eighth grader at Sierra Madre. This is my fourth youngest child. My other three also went through PUSD. I'm also a, a member of the Association of Latino Employees at Pasadena City College as an employee there, 14 years. So. I really appreciate you taking the time to address these concerns. Um, I would have, have a comment. I've been putting, I put um, a UCLA report in the chat talking about the first year of Latin and Latino deaths in COVID and why it should matter and why you should care. So the fact that we're um, expecting vaccinations for our teachers is great. As an educator, you know, I'm in line for those vaccinations as well. That makes me feel good about myself and my job. However, when we're returning to school and we have children whose parents are, you know, either in a high risk sector, they're essential workers like Latino uh, parents, many of them have been affected drastically because we're essential workers um, and they don't have vaccinations, then you're compromising an entire community that at this point has already been drastically compromised. Um, so I think my concern here is that in creating policy and creating mandates or creating these um, uh, this legislature, um, we should be centering the most vulnerable population and their needs and meeting their goals, not necessarily making them an exception. And when you're saying, well, if they can't go back, then, you know, that's fine. Either they, um, they can keep their kid at school or keep their kid home if they don't want to be exposed. But I feel like that's not a good way to look at this. And do you have anything to say about um, the racial disparities and how it's affecting Latino folks and what they're, what the legislature is doing to, to fix that? And then Absolutely. also, and also um, will you be having these talks with Spanish speaking community or have you locally in Pasadena? So I, when, when I don't represent Pasadena, so I would encourage you to, you know, I did this as a favor to, to Sandra. Um, that's she's very, a personal that's very kind. friend of mine. Um, so I, I've gotten requests to speak um, all over the state and I've turned almost all of them down. So, um, so that's, that's one. Two, in terms of the disparities, no, the disparities are absolutely horrendous. Um, and you know, we, you know, when you look at uh, Latinos, African-Americans, uh, the infection rates, the communities, I mean, if you look at the COVID map for LA City, LA County, um, you are absolutely right, the communities which uh, house our essential workers have been hit the hardest. Uh, COVID has hit the communities the hardest, the, the way exactly what we thought 
th they would do, which is um, it's, it's identified our vulnerabilities. Uh, the communities that were vulnerable are more vulnerable, they're not less. And so we absolutely are concerned. So in the same category as school educators are many of the essential workers you talked about. It's farm workers, uh, grocery store clerks, people who are working. So workers are a part of the same category as educators. And so the, the families that you are talking about that remain at risk, we would hope continue or would be able to get vaccination at the same time as educators. Uh, this is not about a Sophie's choice. This is not about teachers or grocery store workers. Uh, they both have to get vaccinated uh, and, and, they're, and they're both in the same uh, priority. Um, and so we absolutely uh, want, want to do that. And, and frankly, the biggest issue, the biggest reason I've been advocating for going back to school isn't my own kids and their personal experience. It's really, um, you want to talk about uh, a travesty is look at the a learning loss. At least we saw the data in San Francisco. Every community, but white kids, including Asian kids, every community, including Asian kids, were suffering huge amounts of learning loss in San Francisco Unified. The equity gap in schools is growing. That's the gap I'm, I'm concerned about and really trying to solve. Uh, if we don't get kids back to school, we could be losing you know, a generation of children uh, because of a lack of education. So I think we do need to figure this out. And if you look at the data, the, the data is clear. I mean, the, you know, the CDC data, the schools that have been open, and you know, again, while LA Unified's not open, I, I imagine that most of your private schools are open because that's the way it exists in San Francisco. So it's not that children aren't in classrooms, children aren't with teachers. Um, and I understand the population is different, but again, um, you're seeing, uh, you're not seeing the kind of infection rates you would anticipate. Uh, from even you know dining indoors at a restaurant so you know part of my frustration has been seeing restaurants open and i look at i love eating restaurants as much as anybody else but you know, the fact that restaurants got priority over schools to me was a little bit um uh, puzzling from a policy point of view but no there's no question uh, your, your your points are extraordinarily well taken that um this is something that is uh, you know there's been a huge equity gap it's a huge problem uh, we absolutely have been very focused on ensuring um, that, you know, especially the Latino community in particular, has been really getting, uh, trying to make sure they get access to uh, PPE, to the proper um, uh, health care and the testing, as well as all the vaccinations. So we, we I do appreciate your question. Bill, I have a question from our friend, Sharon Danks. She was having a problem with raising her hand. So Yeah, I saw uh, Sharon, Sharon in the, yes. yeah. Is Sharon in LA now? She was in the Bay Area before. She's I'm in still... the Bay Area. Yeah. <laughs> okay. you're, 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 you're bombing this Zoom. <laughs> She's not from Pasadena. I know. Well, we're, we've been working with, with Sandra and others on a, a national COVID-19 outdoor yeah, learning. Sharon's initiative. schools are opening up in Berkeley. They just announced it. They did. They did. But, but my, question, my question is about um, is about outdoor learning. I wanted to follow on what Karen brought up and to see Sure. If it's possible to to find um, more support at the state level, where we've been we've been running a national COVID nineteen outdoor learning initiative, um, ten strands, Green Spilliards America, Lawrence Hall of Science, and and San Mateo County Office of Ed founded this effort back in June, and we've we've pulled together thousands of people from around the country around the idea of taking all of learning outside because the the transmission rates outside are nineteen times lower according to some studies than inside, and it. We see this when we see adults going outside for restaurants um, and there's a call for parity for children. How do we get children outside into the safer locations that is also less transmission happening for teachers? So our proposal is in addition to vaccinating teachers, how do we, how do we move people outside to further increase the insurance that transmission won't occur as vari variants happen and as, as um, you know, the, we're hitting a moving target with trying to address the pandemic, it's just safer outside. And the, we've put together a pretty vast website of how-to information, um, a library of how, to, how school districts can take learning outside, but we really need more state-level support in California to, to help schools do this, to let them know it's a possibility, to help them access funds to do cost-effective um, outdoor classroom settings and you know mealtime when everyone takes off their masks, for example, would be great to all have outside. California has near-perfect weather. And yet school districts in Maine are far ahead of us in even going outside through all the winter. 
um, with classes. Well, so I, I I'm going to <laughs> channel Go Governor Brown for a second. So, which is really, uh, and I would encourage you to do this. It's like, look, we we made a decision when I first got to the legislature to really try to uh, push more local control. And and I'm and I think I'm a huge proponent of local control at the school level. Um, Although my my dis my district's been a little bit erratic of late, uh, but I would say that I'm a huge proponent. I think where where it's not been great is really during this one situation where you have a pandemic. You got over a thousand districts. You got 58 county public health officers, one state public health off. It's just been this is the only time I really wish we did not have local control. Um, but you know, with your proposal, I really would encourage you to work with you know local districts to really get get teachers. I think teachers are under right now so much stress, just like students. I mean, and they're just hiding it, frankly. I just see it um, uh, all around the city, but all around the state. And I think we, we need to at least um, be able to get them back to their routine within within their own classroom, I think, before pushing them to do other things. Now, mm -hmm. if you have volunteers and you have places that are willing to pilot this, I think it's great, go for it. But I, I think it's just very hard at this point where we're just trying to get back to some level of normalcy to, to really push this on a larger scale. I think it's very difficult to scale right now too. Well, we, we're not, we're not uh, suggesting that anyone has to do it. We just would love to see it offered as a, a official option. The CDC has now now has language in their materials that suggests that schools could take classes outside, but I think school districts don't know it's possible and they don't know where to find the funds. So it would be great to just have the state funds, the relief funds, say well, this, this, you can the use state, their inside the, state, the way the state funds go is they give money to the district and the district can pretty much spend ah. it for them. They have complete control. Okay. And if sense. they and if they tell you they don't, they're not being totally honest with you. So good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Cynthia. Hi, thank you for having this call. Um, I'm a parent of you know, LAUSD. And um, I think a lot of us um, are starting to feel that um, we're concerned that the teachers are going to get these vaccines and then the union is going to move the goalpost again because there hasn't been an agreement. And I think we're just, you know, Butner is saying, oh, hey, just once we get the vaccines, we can open, but with no agreement. A lot of us just wanna know, like, tell us the truth because a lot of us parents, we need to make some decisions about our children. Yeah, and we're getting strung point. along like two more weeks. Oh, and then, oh, after spring break is what our, our, our principal is saying, but then math doesn't add up. So it's just like, can you help us with that? Like, can you yes, help absolutely. us in yeah. way? I mean, that's what we're trying to do. So that's why, I mean, I introduced AB, AB 10 in December. Uh, I started having discussions on this issue in November. I talked all the way through December. <laughs> We've been talking all the way through January. That, that is the, um, that, that's really the reason why the state's involved. Traditionally, we would leave this up to all the districts, right? But I think given, Cynthia, exactly your point, there's a feeling, especially from all the districts, is they need um, a certain level of certainty. Like, Tell us what to do and we'll go do it, but just tell us. And so I think we, that's what we're trying to do um, uh, within a certain amount of reason. And I think that's the agreement that we're trying to work out at the state level. Um, I'm just gonna say that I'm, you know, a lot of parents that I'm talking to are really considering moving out of California. People are moving, considering moving out of Los Angeles to districts where schools are open. I mean, this is what we're all talking about. It's the only thing we can control. You know, the UTLA and LAUSD have their thing. They don't respond to emails. I mean, like we're all like, that's how we feel like the only thing we can do. So it's like, I, help us. Yeah. Or uh, we're gonna have to like, we have to leave the state. This is what a lot of people are discussing. And it's why we've been, I mean, it's why I've been working for the last three months on this, you know, almost kind of nonstop, so. Well, you know, it, certainly so, Phil, when you talk about, um, it really speaks to the sustainability of public education, right? You know, when we look at um, PUSD, you know, there are families that have moved out of PUSD to go to neighboring districts that may have a, um, reopened or to private schools that mm -hmm. if they have resources. So the equity gap and the achievement gap mm -hmm. is gonna get larger and larger. And as districts are facing a decrease in enrollment, we're really talking about also long-term sustainability mm -hmm. of a healthy 
public education system. And, um, and, so, and so I think as board members are, are considering this, it, it impacts higher ed too, because the public schools K-12 are feeders for community colleges. And that's one of the reasons I thought it would be great to have this conversation because not are we looking at this in the short term, we're also looking at this in the long term. And I'm glad that um, you are giving thought to, to that. So we have 10 minutes so, left. So Cynthia, let me just get back to Cynthia's okay. point. I think it really under, I think going back to your point, Sandra, mm -hmm. um, you know, the reason I've been working so hard on this issue, because I think she what she raised is ultimately it's trust and faith in your public school system, right? And I think what she articulated is a number of parents are losing faith or have, have lost faith, have lost trust. Um, and I think uh, what, you know, what she points to is a much broader issue. I, I agree that this is really about um, the survival of public education in, in California. And so I, I don't wanna be overly dramatic or, or, you know, use too much hyperbole, but, um, you know, people, uh, parents, children, they are, they are pulling their hair out. They don't know what to do. And so um, we, that's why, I mean, we're working extraordinarily hard to try to get a plan that's going to get schools open. So I, I know for many people, the mandate is a great idea, but a mandate where workers don't show up on the first day doesn't mean you're open. Just because you tell people you're open and the people don't show up, then that's a problem, right? And so we're, we're, all, we're trying to find a way that teachers can come back with confidence, parents and children can come back with confidence that we can do this um, kind of together and, and, and also to do it in a way that's doable. Because oftentimes, you know, what, you, what we think is nice in Sacramento isn't doable in Pasadena or in San Francisco or, or Santa Barbara or other places, right? So we got to ensure that what we're doing is actually achievable, is, is doable by all of you on the school boards and on, at the school districts. And so we're, we're really trying to find um, sort of, you know, kind of an appropriate plan that's going to work. Veronica? Hi, um, I think Jenny was waiting before me. I don't want to. Well, Jenny, Jenny, went one, so you go Jenny ahead. already asked a question. I'll wait. Jenny had her turn. <laughs> she, okay. she, I love Jenny. She's just, okay. She's a journalist, so she oh, she you. asked. A, yes, go ahead, um, Veronica, um, and then Scott, and then Jenny. Okay, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, but this, yeah, but this is not a on the record conversation. So hopefully. Oh this, no, it's not. not. It's not on the record. Phil, yeah, I, I, I know. I, I, no, I'm, I'm not writing about it. I, I, I'm, I'm here as a parent. Yes, yeah, I've, I've got 20 here. press calls today, all of which are. <laughs> oh. I know your director, your communications director, will kill me if this is on the record. So no, <laughs> so it's not. It's off the record. So uh, Veronica, go ahead, please. Um, first of all, thank you, Phil and Sandra, for um, putting this out there and everybody that was involved with making this happen. It's nice to have an off the record conversation about um, these things with important people who are, are the decision makers that you know are making things happen in Sacramento. Um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I'm a parent and a noon aide in PUSD. And I don't know if I am in the minority here because I um, heard Cynthia hear what Cynthia is saying about wanting to get kids in and people are moving out of the city. And um, I'm glad that those families are able to um, move right now <laughs> during the pandemic are in a position to be able to do that. But there are obviously a lot of, you know, I'm, my kids are in a title one school and we are on free and reduced lunch and I have three kids in each sector. And um, I don't know if I just want to ask this question because I don't know if this is even a thought for you guys because there are so many parents, like I said, I think I'm the minority. There are so many parents who are pushing for the kids to go back to school, which of course I want my children to be back in school as well. But is there any conversations about waiting until August so that way there isn't so much pressure to get the kids in now when there is not enough vax, you know, vaccines to go around and then we end up going back and then having to leave because people are getting sick so often because that's got to be a factor instead of trying to like wait it out and get everybody vaccinated you know like people 
who work for you know the the aides, yeah. the teachers, and then going back in August when there's been some more time. Yeah, I, I think it's just we're we're so worried about the devastating effects of learning loss and frankly mental health issues. Um, it, it's it's the the mental health toll. I think we're not even really going to know until later. Uh, and so again, um, if if I think if we felt like everything was going fine, we would be like, sure, no problem, right? But I, I mean, it's it's kind of like a bad. Uh, it's a it's a movie where we know how it's going to end and, and we're not, we don't really, we're not really liking the ending right now. So we want to change the plot line. So uh, for, for us, um, no, I, I don't think we are talking about going back in August. So waiting is definitely out, off of the, off the table. It's not, it's not on the table in California. Gotcha. And, okay. I, and actually we're, we're slower than other places. I mean, again, other states have been more aggressive than us. We're not, we're not, we're not a leader. We're a laggard. Right. No, I know that that, and I know that I'm the minority of people who you know think this way. I just feel like if you, we Monica. waited, <laughs> I'm sorry. I agree with you. <laughs> Thanks. A few more I, minutes, so I just want to get a couple questions in. Um, a few well, more in. Scott, you're next. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so this is great. Um, and the outdoor learning, I was advocating for that in the fall because I'm a science guy. Fortunately, we have some outdoors going on in our, our child care for working families in, in Pasadena. Uh, has a little bit of ventilation because it's outdoors, and there's tents. Uh, but Phil, you, you know, when you mentioned mandate, it, it occurred to me what, um, what I've heard some superintendents say is, could we just, could the, could the union allow those teachers who, um, it's not a mandate now, but, but who are willing, you know, to, to go back and, and uh, open some classrooms. Because what we're doing right now is we're having small groups with, not with teachers present, right? But with other staff present in our, for our English learners and our continuation high school students and our, um, well, like I said, working families, we have childcare. And so we have the, you know, the kids with their devices and, and a little bit of staff and they're still on remote. But, but our, I think our, our administrative staff is like, well, can we get some, some teachers that are willing, right? You know what I mean? I mean, I, they would naturally think that, right? So I know you're not talking about a mandate, but I don't know. I don't even know if it's possible. That, to well, that, that, I mean, that, yeah. that can be worked out, you know, yeah, you that, that with so, your unions right now, right? There's nothing. Oh, yeah, and we are. Okay. I, I thought you yeah, were not stopping. Yeah, to, yeah we're, there's, nothing, there's nothing in state law saying, no, you can't go do that. So absolutely. I, I, know, I know. I know. And we are. Uh, and I think, you know, what you yeah, you know, because I know how you said it, how yeah. difficult exactly what you said is to do so yeah, yeah so we'll, we'll, again we'll like there's, there's the we'll ideal try. of what we'd all like and then there's like what we think is doable and we are in what is what we think is doable right now yeah thank you no no thank you uh, preston yes sir um assemblyman ting thank you for your time today uh, i just had a question about whether or not the text of your legislation will be available for public review at any time? The, the text of uh, my legislation is available right now, but we are in the process of uh, negotiating a potential you know, budget trailer bill, which um, you know, would, would hopefully be available for review in the next day or two. So it's on your website? Uh, no. Um, Preston, I, my, I can, my, I can, Preston, I'll send it to you. Fair deal. I'll, I'll send it to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Erica and okay. then Rosemary, and then I'm going to give Jenny the last question and then we're done because we have like 30, 60 seconds and I want to be cognizant of everybody's time. So, okay, here we go. Erica, you have 15 Hi. seconds. Hi. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Go. Yes. Thank you so much for, for putting this together. Um, I'm also an LAUSD parent and just want to say, I think parents do not feel like we have a voice and a say. Um, I, as a Californian, I grew up here. I want everyone to be safe. I want all voices to be heard. And I really believe that every parent, every teacher, every child that doesn't feel safe going back should have that option in California to be home, be virtual, be home for three months, six months, a year, forever. That's fine. but the data and the science have changed my mind 
even in the last month, I was worried sick two or three months ago of ever sending my kids back. And now I have confidence from my doctors, my pediatricians, my kids aren't getting vaccinated till maybe the spring, but I would send my kids back tomorrow. They're wearing masks. If I feel that that is an option, I guess I just want to keep appreciating our representatives who are pushing for choice and options for all families, especially the ones that I see in my community. I, my children attend a school with a tremendous amount of children in, with special needs. And what I'm hearing daily from them is devastating. It is crushing to hear, not just they don't wanna to go to school, but kids are suicidal. They are regressing. Children with IEP services getting absolutely nothing in a year. And I just don't know how we as a state recover from that without giving those families that truly need to be back that safe space and I want to believe, I trust our health department, I trust the CDC, I want to see our leaders, our teachers, everybody just say, let's give this a chance. Let's follow the guidelines. It's not black and white. We will have some, you know, the pandemic, I mean, the, the virus is not going away tomorrow, even with vaccinations. So I just want to say thank you for encouraging this conversation. And I never want to force anybody to get vaccinated or force you back into the schools. But I think we have waited for too long to not talk about the importance of reopening. And I'm just glad that these conversations are happening and that parents are getting a chance to feel heard as well. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. Rosemary, you have know, 10, you have yeah, 10 Before seconds. we get to Rosemary, that the, um, the one group that's come out in strong support of AB10 was the Amer the California Academy of Pediatrics. The, all the pediatricians are, you know, just begging for the kids to go back. Rosemary. I'm sorry, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity and thank you uh, all for making this happening. My question to you, um, and I hear other people saying everybody can't get vaccinated, but vaccines are um, being vaccinated is an option. So even if we have everything, everybody's not going to come for whatever reason and be vaccinated. My question uh, to you, Assemblyman, Assemblyman Ting, is that why then isn't testing mandatory? Um, those that don't get the vaccine that are coming into in-person learning, uh, instructional aides, um, and other classified staff, uh, and even if some teachers are willing to come but they don't want to be vac vaccinated for whatever reason, I haven't heard anyone say that testing cannot be mandated. I think everybody can take the test, the test that they're getting. Yeah, I, I, I think I, I don't know if you heard earlier that the, the testing cadence is definitely part of our uh, proposal and will be mandated. Okay. And the other, can I ask just one other quick question? Sure. You talk about the money. So when is the money? I know some money has been given to the district. I think the question is, when is this other money coming so that some of the school districts that need the money to make sure all things are in place as far as PPE and other upgrades and things that might need to be done to bring everyone back into a safe environment so that they can act. Um, when is that going to happen? Because that could be a delay, you know, in these schools that want to open but don't really have the funds to do a lot of these things because of this virus. So in, in this year's budget, schools already got $5 billion of additional funds for COVID as well as to purchase on PPE or to work on distance learning. Um, I don't know how those districts, all the districts chose to spend that money. Uh, we're talking about an additional 6 billion and the money will be, will go out as soon as the legislature, the governor reach agreement. Hey, Jenny, you have the last question and then we're gonna um, need to wrap this up. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Assembly Member. We really, parents really appreciate you hearing us today and for being a voice for parents. 
I just wanted to ask how we can help. How how can we help? You know, we our, our kids don't have a union. CTA is the most powerful political force in this state. And our parents and kids don't have a strong union. We can't buy ads on TV. What can we do to yeah. be heard right. to help? It, it's a great question. And I wish, I wish this is really where the PTAs should be stronger. Um, I, don't, I don't know in LA. So in San Francisco, we've sort of had parent groups coming together. I don't know if in Pasadena, LA, there've been that. I would encourage um, you all to put parent groups uh, together. Clearly the, the PTA is not adequate because if the PTA couldn't really respond to this situation, it's not really you know, being able to be responsive or be an advocacy voice. So I, I think that's first and foremost, nothing stopping people from going to go do that. And I would really encourage you all because you know parents should get involved in school board races. They should get involved in who are going to be the representatives. And you know te teachers do and employees do. That's their right, and they should do that. Now the parents should do the same thing. So I think um, that that's first and foremost is really really I think you know you have to get organized and to really build that voice. Um, the other thing is we do have a petition. I know my chief of staff Irene Ho is on here, you can go to my website, sign the petition to support AB 10, even though, you know, it, it, you know even though we're, the, the bill, whatever passes will not be AB 10, it's more just you all showing support for the legislation around school reopening and just saying that it's, it's a, you know, it's important. And, uh, you know, I've been really proud to just have so many, um, you know, parents from all around the state, just, just get involved, be interested, wanting to, um, you know, push to be, be responsible and have schools reopen safely. So, um, you know, please, please help me there. But I think, I think my advice to you is you have to go form your own organization to have a voice. Well, we have one, speak up, but we're not loud enough yet. <laughs> we're trying. Well, you need to be speaking louder. <laughs> Let's speak, Jenny, but- um, okay. You, you got to start somewhere. Got to start some. Listen, Phil, thank you so much for being here today. I am just um, delighted that you made time for- My, my pleasure. I'm, I'm going to say Chris Holden needs to do one of my town halls in my district next time. Ah, so. Okay. Well, yeah. I know he could he's, do he's one. He's going to owe me one. He's going to do one on transportation, maybe. But um, no, but that's I, not. No, that's I'll, I'll do that one. That's a much you, easier. That's an easier one. I know because he's not going to well, be in front well, of me. Unless he's talking about the 710. I know he's been talking about the 710 forever. So I'm, I'm avoiding that issue. Well, so we also have Laura Freeman. So it's between uh, Laura and also Chris. But okay. I just want to let you know well, how they, much they, Laura we owes me one, too. I'm going to tell them both when I see him tomorrow. Okay, you do that. <laughs> so I, I want to say thank you so much, Phil. I, I, you know, I, we certainly appreciate the time. You know, we put together, we put this together within a week. I know um, you really um, put us in your schedule and I just really appreciate um, your um, perspective, your feedback and your leadership on this issue. And I also um, want to say thank you to your staff for being so responsive to our requests. And um, I'd like to also thank uh, my school board colleagues um, for, their, for them being here. Um, Scott, Josh, Carolyn, Julie, Jane, um, Caroline, and Tina and Jennifer, um, quite a few newly elected parents, uh, moms um, who were elected to the school board. So, so thank you all for joining us and, and really to the parents. Um, you're probably wanting to make dinner right now or, or, or get back to your, 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 your other jobs. Um, but I just appreciate the time that you have spent with us. And Phil, you know, really, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, for Phil. Thank you. Everybody. No, th thank, you. Thank, thank you again. Also, let me just echo, thank you to all the school board members. I think it's the toughest job there is. You know, thank you for doing it. I think it's, I think it's so incredibly difficult. So, uh, and thanks to all the parents. Really appreciate everyone for yeah. being on tonight. And, you know, fingers crossed, we're going to hopefully be able to get something done soon. So thank yeah. you so much. And to the outdoor learning folks, Sharon, yeah. we're, we're going to keep I, pushing I, the outdoor learning. I was learning. wondering if Sharon had moved. I, I know, I know Sharon personally. So. Sharon, yeah. Sharon worked in the school yard for my child, my child's, uh, my children's elementary school <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Bill, I'm going to end this meeting.